I, I remember that uh, when I was four years old, I was in the kindergarten. Uh, there was one little story I want to show you. The classmate sit next to me is a girl. She was really beautiful and all the teachers loved her. And she drew very well. Each drawing she had made, the teacher would put on the wall. So one day I thought, now if I want to have my work display and get the teacher's attention, perhaps I could do something like her. So what I did was uh, copying what was she doing. So she made a little joy with the mountain like this here on the left hand side, a tree, a house, water down there, a boat, and then the sun is shining here with a couple of birds. So guess what I did? I copied her, but in a reverse composition. I put the mountain on the right hand side. Everything is the same, but on the right hand side. <laughs> and then I thought, now this time the teacher would love my piece of joy. But I was very really disappointed in the end, the teacher did not even have a look because she knew that I was copying. So that story really struck me that um, I really want to draw. And when I was little, as far as I can remember, since I was four, I draw almost everything I can find lying around. Like if there's a little flower patterns on my slippers, a handkerchief with a little flower there, I would just copy. So I think uh, I, I know myself very well. I know that I love to draw since I was really little. So when I go, when I go on the older, uh, one day I asked my father's permission for me to go to a studio to learn how to draw because uh, the mother of my classmate is an artist and she, she taught art, taught drawing. So eventually my father let me go to the studio starting 1967. Uh, I, I started to do sketching. And after the high school study, I really wanted to pursue art, fine art. So I went to, luckily, I went to the United States. My, my family was really poor to start with. I was born in Hong Kong. And my father only had three years of primary school study. And my mother has never had a chance to study. But both of them worked very, very hard. So eventually, um, they could afford to send me to the United States. I'm very, really fortunate and grateful for the support. So after I finished high school study, I went to the United States, uh, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. Then I did my first degree, major in advertising design. But I was not happy. I was not happy in two cents. The first thing is, when I was in America the first year of study, I got this cultural shock. I didn't know why I was there. So I started to ask a question about myself. Uh, who am I? Why am I doing here? Where am I going to in the future? So for, for a long time, I've been asking that question and I was not too happy because I don't have an answer. And at the same time, I got some sort of pressure from my father because he was worried that I may not get a job in the end. So he wrote long letters to me and tried to persuade me to change my study into education. And he believed that when I become a teacher, I would have a secure job. So at the time, it was a conflict. I just didn't know how to handle it. So for a long time, I was unhappy. And then it came to a point that I rebelled about uh, the Chinese culture and the constraint from the family. So deliberately, I only uh, worked with the Western artists. I tried all the uh, avant-garde opposed to 
art like uh, performing art, conceptual art, environmental art. But one artist really influenced me is Judy Chicago. I think she's a Jewish artist and artist. And she made a few projects about, about women identity. And she had the energy to do big projects across the country of the United States. She mobilized all, you know, a lot of women to contribute part of the quilting, you know, making a blanket from different parts of the states and they combine and become a big blanket. And the theme is always around women, like uh, giving birth to a child, uh, women struggle, being independent, being an artist. So in a way I was influenced by the women movement in America, unity, basically very similar. And another artist who uh, influenced me is uh, Eva Hayes. I think she's also Jewish. <laughs> she's really bright. She explores many different media, not just painting or sculpture as such. She tries to use a lot of uh, new material, but very toxic. Unfortunately, she died very young. She died around 30 something, very, very young. So I believe that. Now, when you ask me this question about it, the difference of my art development, how I recall these two women artists who has influence on me. So, for that time, I was uh, still searching about my identity. But this searching becomes really a kind of urge. When I go more mature, I, I really have the energy. It's like exposing my inner energy. So uh, I am now in all this uh, performing art, I'm participating in organizing community art uh, during the university study. For example, we invite other university uh, professors and students to come together in one weekend. We hire the student union building and everything happened in that building within one day. And, um, there was a professor who put in a big pot of water and then he put more water in it and he put cereal in it. You know, the breakfast cereal? So it melted, right? And then he take a bath <laughs> in the cereal. One piece of work is like that. Another piece of work is um, um, a man and woman artist take off their clothes. In a room, they put candles on the floor. And then they walk around the candles in the room. So this is an example. So all this kind of uh, activity really hit me hard. And I was puzzled. I remember that I get upset in the end. Why? Because I have to help to clean up the mess. After all this performance and happiness gone, and the TV come to be calling the event, and it was reported uh, on news, and everybody was watching and get excited about the news of the art event. I was the only one cleaning the cereal on the floor, and I remember that I cried. My tears just came out. I, I was still puzzled. Why? Why I get involved in such a crazy things? What are the values of this kind of art form? You know, I was really puzzled. I was really young. I was really puzzled. But then after that, um, I get more frustrated. But then um, I move on. After finish uh, my first degree and second degree in America, I move on and then I visited uh, New Zealand. And in New Zealand, uh, I work with another of artists. That was in the late 70s. I finished uh, my study in the United States at around mid 70s. That towards the end of uh, the 70s, uh, by chance I was in New Zealand and Australia. Then in New Zealand, I got more involved with the local artists. And a group of artists get together and uh, we paid about $80 New Zealand money to rent a space, a dumpster factory. Factory, nobody uses it anymore. Um, 30 
3,000 square feet thick. And the artists have a little space for their own creation. Um, we, can, we, have, we have a Wednesday evening for poem reading, uh, art sharing, exhibition. We, we run a community project, we run people come see. I was the community member. I was very involved. And then I was very active in New Zealand, um, doing all kinds of uh, exhibitions, um, the mountain exhibition and things like that. After that, uh, I was invited to go to Australia to be the artist in residence for a couple of years. Um, then um, I start to introduce Chinese culture in the creation. Like in the early 80s, I studied this uh, craft, a wood paper mining craft from the old master of um, Hong Kong. Then I start to Expand the traditional art in the contemporary form. And in the 1985, I think, I was invited to take part in the Sydney Biennale. And in that exhibition, I produced 141 heads, paper, paper, and the traditional craft. Um, the head is about a Chinese woman hairstyle. Ranging from the war, warrior stage to the revolution stage. By doing so, within maybe one, uh, two or three months' time, I ran through the Chinese history <laughs> very quickly. And by studying the Chinese human hairstyle, I, I, I can see how the woman in Chinese history has gone through many different stages um, of womanhood. For example, uh, how women has been constrained to the culture, constrained to the family structure. So you can see the hairstyle somehow become very tight, very complex. And the highest point is in the Tang Dynasty, really fancy hairstyle with the flower hanging there big flower hanging on the head, in the hair. And then in Song Dynasty, they even wear head, beautiful head, really very hard forehead, like a Chinese landscape, being made of silk. I was fascinated about that kind of hairstyle. And then when the peak of the history of China developed in the Golden Age, and then it's dropped down, and then when it comes to the Ming and the Qing Dynasty, the hairstyle become really simple, tiny, tied up, really, really simple. To my amusement, when it got into the 60s, the Red Revolution, it's only one big cut. All the women hairstyle in front become one big cut. So standard. It's so standard that it seems that the Chinese woman has never had their own face. No individuality, no character. But the most uh, common one is uh, uh, tying up the hair like, uh, what do we call this? This is dance. Dance. This kind of hairstyle has nothing to do with any period of time or history. It's primitive. From the war warrior state to the Red Revolution, you always see this kind of hairstyle. Now let me put that a little bit uh, to the history. Actually, when the hairstyle get into uh, the war, you will uh, forget how to stay in the village, which is after the Qing Dynasty, which is before the Communist, Communist Party. At that time, during the 1940s, 30s, huh, women have their hair dyed in different color, in red, in orange, really uh, always just like the contemporary hairstyle with a uh, hair perm. And uh, that time, again, is really different from the rest of the history. Of course, when they move on to the 60s, it becomes no 
gender difference. Anything, no matter if it's the hair or the uniform, men and women look the same. So my hairstyle stopped there. The question is, what next? What next? The what next is so huge that I don't know how to handle it. So then later on, it becomes uh, the fourth dimension about this uh, third phase piece, the woman hairstyle. It becomes only one head, but made with a uh, uh, digital file. And it becomes plastic. But the head is a red guard with the serpents put in the glass box with the mirrors all around it. Okay, maybe I can tell you a little bit about why doing self-portrait. <laughs> doing self-portrait is not equalistic. Doing self-portrait is about finding out about myself. At least um, the portrait themselves tell you a bit of my feelings at that moment. Now these two portraits done at the same time more or less. But this one seems look a bit younger than this one. Perhaps because of the color or perhaps because of uh, the expression. Now when I look at the eyes, it seems that the eyes are not searching about something. It might be about the future or maybe not too happy. But this one seems more contained. Uh, I was more peaceful and things like that. But basically, I explore the line qualities. Um, starting the study of color again, the contrast between green and orange. Somehow, this may be the favorite blue color of Van Gogh. <laughs> really high contrast of color. So my, in my early drawings, apart from doing self-portrait, the other major thing is woman, woman body. That's it. So in a way this one single head reflected in the mirrors is the infinity. So when well, that come to a stage that uh, history and culture uh, has gone beyond the boundary. My artwork go beyond the boundary. It becomes N dimension, not even fourth dimension. It's N dimension. So in short, um, my artistic life is about that much. But it comes to a later stage now, it's the classical world. I am more interested by the Buddhist teaching. So after the series of painting about the appropriated images, done in 1987, I stopped doing any creation. By then, uh, I got married, <laughs> I started a family, and later on I have a son. So for quite a while, for about maybe 10 years, I did not create anything. So can you imagine how painful it, it was for me not to create? But then uh, I pick up uh, and I think another thing to do, I pick up uh, academic work, I do research. <laughs> so I did research for a while, then I get uh, uh, bored. And when I, my son go older, I start uh, to create again. So in 2003, in the 90s, I did not really create. I, I, I did a lot of academic research. So in 2003, I was invited by the Heritage Museum in Hong Kong to present the, the woman hairstyle again. That become a fourth dimension. So I, I just uh, talked about it early on. And then after that, um, I felt that uh, I need to express myself a bit. So I was inspired by my student, actually. Um, every year, in the last 10 years, I brought students overseas to do a study, or field trip studies. Usually we went to uh, China and a few times in Taiwan. In the field trip, we trained students to use sketchbook to sketch. So seeing them doing wonderful sketches themselves, I can't help to try out myself. Now what made me really 
sketch again was in 2009. In 2009, I was uh, uh, tech, I, 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 I went to India with my friend. So in India, I start to sketch. Actually, that was a spiritual visit. Uh, I get to some temples and things like that. So when I get back home uh, in 2010, that's the end of uh, 09, the Chinese New Year, I bought uh, some flowers. I bought some flowers like uh, really, really fresh, uh, fresh flower. But then I, I watched the flowers uh, getting old and, and, and die. Oh, let, me, let me check this book here. So when I bought the flower, the second day of the Chinese New Year, it, it was like this, with very bright red. But then I watched it changing day by day, and then I saw that they can, they can bloom very nicely, very huge and bright. But then later on, they start to die and fall down. So. My sketches are like a record, a documentary of the flower starting from day one till the tenth day of the new year. It looks like that. Even though they look like that, I think they still get some sort of beauty that's in there. So this is the end of their life. <laughs> and uh, that amazed me. Amazed me about the impermanence of everything. So. I get so excited, so I start to do a lot of sketching on lotus flower, like this. Trying different kind of media, trying a different approach. Some are very close up, really, really close up to see the details. Some are very subtle, uh, semi abstract, but you still can recognize it. But it gives you some room space to imagine that this might be something else. Okay? They're dying again. <laughs> Keep dying. But beautiful. So, this is uh, my start of the series of uh, flower sketches. Um, I, I, still, I still do it nowadays. Even uh, before this exhibition. I, I make a few particular for this exhibition held at the Art Centre of the National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. But before I say anything about this story, I'm going to show you the sketch of it. It's just like that, very, very simple. Without knowing what's going to happen here, I just have a feeling about Someone seems to blow up something. Someone seems in charge of the circuit that I don't know what. But lately, when I've been here for this exhibition, I find this open. I use all this thing. And when I put another layer of 
oil on the top, they become very vibrating. So when I do something quite here, suddenly I feel that I need to something dark here. And when I put some red here, I feel that I need to a red, to do a red here. So this, this is a kind of natural correspondence between the color reaction. And then uh, at that moment, I was fascinated by how color responding to themselves. And then I suddenly realized that I have nothing to do with them because they guide me to execute the placement of the color. And I was fascinated by such phenomenon. I felt that I was the third person out there and the color was actually doing their own job. I'm no more than a messenger <laughs> to help them to talk to each other. Now, that kind of feeling carried on for quite a while. I was all by myself doing this painting. I don't know how much, how many hours I spent on, on the painting. Then I get so absorbed in the painting. Suddenly the phone rang. Phone rang. Then I went to pick up the phone. Then I realized that I need to pick up the Because I suddenly lost the language to the view. I was somewhere else. I was somewhere else in a, in a total world of its own. It's not here, not in this world. I was somewhere else. That was a very unique experience in my life. First time I was somewhere else, not here. And then that was the first time I experienced that something deep inside us. Okay, ability, whatever, spirituality, whatever, it will come out of itself. If you allow the time and space for it, don't let anything bother. Let it stay in a very pure state of mind. Just simply doing something you can enjoy and you search, and then things will happen. Now, this kind of uh, experience. Later on, that was in the 80s, eh? So now it's what, 201 here, eh? Now when I practice uh, meditation, the Buddhist meditation, I find a similarity. Similarity with mom and dad. Chasing the matter, not looking for the result, but naturally let the feeling is So that, that's why I want to describe that. However, this, this piece of painting for that particular experience is really significant for me. Now, when I remember it and I tell the Sand Master about this experience. <laughs> And I asked the advice of uh, how I practice my meditation. And sometimes I worry that my creation might be in conflict with my meditation. But I was reassured by that. No, there's no conflict. Like a big painting. I may have quick sketches. So I have some sketches here that I did not know what how to use it later on. However, I did a few quick sketches. Then I also uh, do some quick sketches like this, with quick lines and everything. Then based on this, I will develop some. I will develop something like this. So this two is actually two finished painting on its own. Two really well done painting. However, I was not happy about this result. So what I did was to compile this two with two other new painting, make a new composition. But then I add that sketch of the hand in here. So I make a new composition. So you can see that 
for this part here, I actually cover the whole thing with color. And same as this here, the body was actually covered with color. So the whole thing is unified. When you get a close up, very close up look here, for example, you can do a close up maybe here in this area. It might remind you of a maid. I have two weapons here. The water lily of a maid. And you get close up on this painting. You can see this is a really, really rich color with many, many layers of different color. Then it emerged into a final color by some water and something beautiful. I'm sure now when I talk about it, I'm sure. This is an influence by the investments. I think they, they are interested in the light and the light on the color and how they represent the reality but in an abstract way. So uh, for this one, for this painting, um, I really enjoy doing it because I love the orange, the orange color. Uh, was really really pure when I used the, the color at that time. Okay, if this world is only women, one sex, they will be more harmonic. And uh, of course, it's not uh, maybe it's not so interesting, but will be more harmonic. And. Uh, because it's harmonic, so maybe we'll reach the heaven um, easy, more easy, instead of uh, dragged down by the male. <laughs> there is one woman pointed up to the sky. I think that is something inspired by intelligent creation. Okay, let me say something. I can see the influence from Henry Moore again. And my name, the, the, my name, the naked, the, the naked woman with the very smooth body and body and and this structure seems very creative that all done Nated by woman <laughs> and with uh, uh, very powerful gestures pointed to the sky. I think I would like to have. Uh, would you please explain more about how this idea come to your mind and? Could you elaborate more about this? Okay. So uh, I did I did quite a number of uh, very very little uh, male figures, but woman figures uh, were always an interest to me because of the form, the shape, and color. And uh, I always could do so much with the body in terms of the form, I can twist them, blow them up, make it skinny, make it, make it fat. No matter what shape I gave them, they still look pretty to me. <laughs> so uh, for, for this painting, I think is maybe towards the end of the whole series. So uh, the kind of intensity of being a woman myself and the search for the liberation as a human being, uh, more or less come to a stage that I feel, well, okay, after all, there must be an outlet for it. 
an outlet for it. So I, my feeling at that time was either heaven or hell. <laughs> what about on earth? What the heck we are doing on earth? What the woman has been doing on earth? Okay. Then in this particular painting, it, it is very interesting that I play enough with the color. Now I get into the texture. So when I did my painting, I did not use any brush because I used oil stick. And with oil stick, I use the knife. I get the oil from the knife. And actually, I smash the paint on the paper on the surface. I don't use the joystick to draw like that. So the more I stretch the color on it, the more I feel like I was doing sculpture. I was sculpting. I was sculpting all over, smashing with color. But later on, color is morning. I play with white. With white that almost like I was carving a marble. The, the white almost cover all the underleaf color. And then the more I do it up, the more like Harry Moore in a sense. <laughs> it becomes so sculptural. And, and then I find out that the texture, when it's mixed with many layers, then it can create some very interesting color here. It, 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 it's like the color of um, copper. It's like color of stone, color of marble. Then I find that if the whole thing looks like that, I can become very boring. So suddenly I want to liberate one woman with pure color again. And this one, it just felt so good. Oh, naturally, so good and relaxed. Then, accidentally, it turned out to be very much like Montigani. <laughs> the, the, the beautiful color, so relaxing. Of course, his is elongated female. Mine still really bulky, but very relaxing. And then, suddenly, I feel like, wow, what a release to be relaxed. Why not going to heaven? <laughs> so pointing up there, then of course in heaven you got to have a, a lot of cloud and perhaps some angels, angels with their wings. Now I, I was really happy to, to do this with the color, etc., etc. Again, because of preparing this exhibition, I do some. A review of my own painting and then I find this painting because uh, a couple weeks ago I had dinner with some very very old friend that we met when we were a child when I show him this picture the photo of this painting he said ah oh, this painting looked like Genesis and I suddenly break through and said Ah, that was what I was trying to paint. Then I take out some reference. Then I go back to Michelangelo. And then I find, oh, the, the hand of God, the creation of Adam. Then I suddenly realize this is the creation of Eve. <laughs> and that might uh, answer your earlier statement like it's so harmonic when they are just all women. Of course, when a lot of women together, maybe more than three, you got troubles. <laughs> but this one is suddenly is like a kind of very symbolic meaning to me. It's the liberation. It's breaking through. Relaxing and then we're thinking of Eve. So, who made Eve? To me, it is not God. To me, it is ourself. Ourself making Eve. So, again, I'm very happy to mind this exhibition because it gave me a chance to, to reveal uh, my deep feeling at that time. I was too busy to paint, to do all kind of exhibition and projects. But now I'm getting older, I find it's time that I can quietly be the And I'm happy to 
find these new meanings to me and so that I can share with, with many, many other women as well as men. Maybe uh, I could, maybe 
that would explain why I say I'm inspired by Chinese. First of all, I was convinced I, I was that I was given a commission to do a Chinese painting for what he had done to it when he was in Cuba. And um, this is actually what I did. Passes, he was much bigger. But I did it without using the paint and brush on, on paper. I did it on with a rustic medium. And when I did it, I, I was really amazed by the stroke that I tried imitating the Chinese brush And uh, it turned out very much, the feeling turned out very much like a Chinese painting. You are right, because in Chinese painting, always leave a lot of space to suggest that this might be the sky, this might be the water, and this might be the path for people to walk through. That I bear in mind. Um, but for, for this painting, I, I adapt some characteristic of Chinese painting. Is that the perspective of Chinese painting? Chinese painting perspective can combine different point of view in one composition. For example, you could, you could have a bird's view in the composition, and you can also have a far distant view or a close-up view, all happen on the same page. So this painting, I try to include that kind of uh, openness for perspective in it. Now, in order to deal with the empty space, I use a lot of white color in this painting. But I cannot leave so much white on the page. Then I try, whenever I use white on this uh, canvas, I try to create a story, you know, create the image of the stream running down, or the cloud is floating around, like the mist is around. But I think I failed in a sense because I was really angry. <laughs> the, the explosive kind of energy keep going on. So eventually the white color one went all over the page. Almost out of control. It almost wanted to tip over the whole page. Then I have to struggle about how to balance the amount of white using on this painting with other paints. So that was a big struggle. So from this painting, I did it for a long time. <laughs> then I could not stop because I had not really resolved the problem. However, later on, I turned around and said to myself, okay, look, Forget about the world. How about focus on building up the body into a kind of three dimensional form? To turn it into a kind of rock, a mountain. So at least my anger could be hold up the form. Then I spent a lot of time to deal with the form of the figures. Now, this time I have male and female together. Then when I put them together, the body of the female, the form of the female, somehow was taken over by the male. Because the male was bigger and larger, and their power stretched out even more. Then the woman figure suddenly became broken down into pieces, become all over the place. Then I felt, well, perhaps this is useful. If it builds a good context, we all go up to all over the places. This is the basis. That, that was almost out of the Have you put together now? I better be. <laughs> <laughs> because this was done in 89, 1989. Uh, right? Now I think uh, I'm 
curious about this question. I'm looking forward to paint again with this medium and again on this type of medium. And I would like to see what comes out of it. That would be interesting. Now, to answer you this way, when I look back to the whole series, series of all, there are a couple of points I want to say. Firstly, I think this is a series of all good quality. I think they are good paintings. Somehow, it's I that was not for me. <laughs> the thing, the point is that I don't think I can paint on a personal level. Secondly, um, from doing this painting, I, I transform a lot of feeling through the use of color, through the study of uh, human figures, the form, or through another level of deeper understanding of the relationship between people, the relationship between them. And then when I expand it to a wider perspective, um, it guides me through the path to look around and I find many ways of seeing it. Many ways of seeing it. that kind of upset feeling. So deliberately, I would use more beautiful color. So when you see the most beautiful color of my painting, you know that's the most upsetting piece when I did it. Because I need to strike a balance. So if we, if, if our camera could zoom me more closely to some of the color, a close up of the color, See, they are white rage, okay? They are fighting for each other. However, in the end, they get a harmonic result. So I've been working very hard in my painting. During the process, I might struggle with the subject matter, with the color. But then in the end, always, the color has their own dialogue. They always speak for themselves. And it comes to a point that sometimes I do not need to do much because they speak for themselves. Now for that little bit, I can tell you more story than other things. Actually, this is during the 1980s. I met an artist uh, on a beach. He came, he's a, he was a young man from China, maybe in his uh, 25, 26 years old. He was really eager to go to France, to Paris. He want to make it as an artist there. He tried very, very hard, but you can imagine, during the early 80s, China was just open after a long while, okay? So this artist have nothing but only his hands. He made sculpture with sand on the beach. He had nothing when he came to Hong Kong. Amazingly, he did, he did beautiful work. His sculpture is put in proportion. Everything is right. Now, I've, he made his own face himself in the sand and let water run through it. Now, this kind of poetic feelings is really close to me. I, I share that kind of feeling with him. Can you translate this bit, please? And in this two, on both sides and the top, those are mirrors. So when you get close to look at this head, 
you look on the side and the top, you see infinitive has. Now, I only got 100 something out there. So I, I will tell you some crazy idea I have. Though I may give you an impression that uh, Buddhism have changed me or made me peaceful and soft, and, but, but inside sometimes I still play like a wild kid, okay? So some ideas is like that. You know those uh, paper hat I made? Uh, I actually have 120 something have digitized in digital file. And from those digital file, we can make products out of it. So I made very little hat like this, which can be used like jewelry. And I have some idea of using this little hat to make, turn it into a piece of bread. And at one point, I tried to do fundraising for the business community. So my idea, my idea is that any one of you is interested to purchase a piece of bread. Okay, you donate money, you get a piece of bread. Then on the designated day uh, in a defined area of uh, empty land, each one will line up and then each one will, will install all that piece of work together and then it becomes the Great Wall. So the title of the exhibition is The Great Wall Without Boundary. The Great Wall Without Boundary. In the past, the Great Wall is for making boundary to protect a country, right? Now my great, my great Wall is without boundary for the love of the universe. So just imagine that if you are in the space and if you looking down to the earth, suddenly you find this long piece of line, golden color, a bit shiny, and that's my piece of great wall. <laughs> and just imagine that there's one piece in Taiwan. So which area would be a good place for this great wall? Propose. Any suggestion? Any empty? Space, a land that could be good for this piece of great wall. Then I'm thinking, what, how to, or where to put it in Hong Kong, which is so tiny. Then I think, ah, what about Germany? Yes, there's the European Institute of Applied Buddhism. They have a big piece of land. Then I think, ah, what about another Buddhist center? <laughs> they always have empty land. Huh? So imagine if I locate some Buddhist meditation center or temple and do a great work there, let people participate. So you donate a piece of bread and make the, the great work. It's your gesture about supporting peace and love in the world. So this is one idea. The other idea is to bury the 120 something head at the bottom of the real great war in China. The other one is to create an old thumb underground, cave underground, and bury the head there. Because the head sometimes become a burden. I carry this head over 20, 30, 20 something years, almost 20 years now. And I have to look up to them and stuck them all in the tiny little space in my Hong Kong apartment. You know how small is Hong Kong and how expensive is this space. So the latest idea is to turn the head into a kind of plant. Growing plant <laughs> all around the head, like growing grass and growing moss. So just picture that this brownish clay looking head looks green <laughs> looks green and imagine that it's placed in the in the garden placed in the wood placed in the forest placed back in the nature so somehow i think i haven't changed that much that much since uh, 
since my college life when I playing around with rocks. But the idea become more mature in terms of skill, in terms of methods, in terms of the time presentation, and also the thinking is much different. But I still wanted to be more playful. I mean, when I start the family, I could not create. That was a kind of suffering. I felt so bad. Then I was naive. I believed that okay, now if I cannot create, perhaps I could do research. By that time, I started my teaching career at the university, and uh, I mean, I taught uh, design of different disciplines, including uh, multimedia design, foundation design, product design. And I always did administration work. Can you imagine that an artist become an administrator? <laughs> and uh, I told myself, now if I cannot, if I could not uh, create, perhaps, perhaps I could research. But I was naive because research is like creation. You can't stop when you are in the middle of some data collection or data analysis. You can't to concentrate. Sometimes I cannot even move out from my chair, even though I have to go to the washroom, because I was worried that the data will will be gone. <laughs> that was a kind of uh, intensity. So for a long time, I taught, but I love to teach. I love young people. When I was with young people, I my heart was young. My heart is still young. I keep myself. So teaching design is also um, a kind of belief that uh, art and design cannot survive without people. It can't stand alone. So there's always people. So in my whole career of teaching, people come first. That means my students come first. Sometimes the students come first more than my son. Uh, I stay in the school from early morning till early late. So one day when my son growing up, I gave him very little time. I sometimes felt so bad. The only way I could comfort myself was saying to myself that, oh, please God, if I treat other people's children so well, please help keep my child well. <laughs> and um, for teaching design, I think uh, it's a kind of profession to get very close to my love of art. Because in teaching design and doing design work myself, I still keep my art practice. For example, here this book is about the ideas of jewelry design. The theme was about the relationship, about zero and one, some abstract thinking in Saint Vincent. Actually, the secret was I was so bored in one meeting. I can't help to start sketching something. <laughs> So these are uh, some sketches done in my teaching life. So this uh, idea was that um, my 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 son have a long hair tail at the back. He has it for 14 years. So when he reached 14, um, we decided putting himself that no longer long tail because he is he was in high school. So one day his father cut his hair tail off and then for that hair tail I start to think about a piece of jewelry. So in this uh, design I imagine that I find a piece of jade wing and I have the hair tied in it. So a different method of tying his hair. And I imagine that one day I could wear this uh, piece of jewelry. Then my son would look at it every day. <laughs> so hopefully he will appreciate the love of the parents. That's how I should appreciate the love.
love for my parents. So in teaching design, I could still create. So that might be a kind of uh, room space, mental room space I create for myself while I, I was having Talking about my teaching, my creation, um, somehow they reflect my way of seeing the world, my way of doing creation in terms of painting and sculpture, whatever. So we could do a summary like this in this exhibition. In this exhibition, we have three areas of presentation. The first area is the series of painting of appropriated images. The series was done in 1987 to 89. That series of painting meant a lot to me because at that moment I tried to explore color again. And that led me to study the old masters. However, uh, my artworks are always involve people. When I look back my other art projects, like community art, environmental art, whatever, people are always part of my creation. Either they really help making that piece of art, or they are directly, indirectly involved in looking at my art or moving things to the site to build up the exhibition. This element of people is always important to me. I don't like to shut the door and do things for my own happiness in that sense. I always find happiness uh, through working with other people. And that's why I enjoy teaching. My students are actually my teachers. They teach me. They remind me about being young at heart. They remind me of doing stupid things is okay. <laughs> we, we grow up by making mistakes. And so um, in this exhibition, um, I also show the sketchbooks, which is the full documentary of my artistic life, the development from sketches done in teenagers, like in the 60s, to the sketches done six months ago in Canada. Also in this exhibition, I, I'm inspired by the series of windows on one side of the gallery. So one idea is to mount a lot of empty frames, okay, without any images, on the glass of the window, so that I expand the boundary of the gallery. My work can be seen from outside. The audience or the students who pass by this art center who may not come in to this art center, they have a chance to see the exhibitions. And also looking out from inside of this center, we can see the beautiful trees and all wonderful movements passing by the windows. So in a way, I try to demonstrate to people in many occasions, in many exhibitions, the ways of seeing, how we look at our life, how we could be sensitive with what's going on around us. But the important thing is that you have to be there. You have to be on the path so that you walk through the path, you create the path for your own destination. 
So the title of this exhibition is about voices. If in the end that um, the audiences they come to see my exhibition, which inspire them to look at things differently, um, try to uh, get away from the old pattern of seeing things, I would be very happy. Thank you.